Millions of people living their lives. People we pass in the street and barely even notice. But in those crowds are ordinary men and women with extraordinary stories to tell. Stories of heroism and hope, of beating the odds and blazing a trail. Those moments of chance that change lives forever. In this series, I'll be traveling across the country, coming face to face with people you may never have met, but whose experiences you'll never forget. These are Welsh Lives. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. A snapshot in time which, when recorded, becomes a moment in our history. But the story behind any one single image is one that runs far deeper than the image itself. To many of us, the name John Downing may not be immediately familiar, but his work, his photographs, are ones which are recognized the world over, even though we might not realize it. Each year there's a Photographer of the Year competition, and now I'd retired, so I wasn't involved in it. I was sitting there and I said, oh, what's, what's that noise, what's that singing? That's my choir, it's my choir. And They'd, they'd sprung the surprise on me, brought the choir on, and announced they were giving me a Lifetime Achievement Award. Only the second time it had ever been given out. Oh. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. now, you know, it's mm -hmm. still now, it's still. Born in Llanethli to Welsh-speaking parents, John Downing spent an impressive 50 years on Fleet Street, documenting some of the most significant events of our time. But even to this day, he still remembers the moment he first found his love of photography. You know, to put a bit of white paper in some liquid, and then suddenly a picture would appear. And I was sold on it then. Uh, I was, must have been about 13. I thought that was magic. Then, uh, as I got a little bit older, uh, an apprenticeship came up on the Daily Mail. And so I stood there and, and got the job. And, um, and that was a five-year apprenticeship. So I learned a lot then. After his apprenticeship, John took up a job with the Daily Express, where he eventually became their chief photographer. I remember the excitement of walking down Fleet Street half midnight when I finished my shift and seeing the fans come down the street with the names on Daily Express, Daily Mail, even, you know, just... And I'm feeling the excitement that in there, in that Daily Express fan was papers and my pictures in one of them, you know, and uh, I, that excitement never left me. During his career, John covered a variety of major news events but made a name for himself in 1971 with his first overseas assignment. The civil war in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, uh, broke out and um, they wanted someone to go immediately, but at that time you had to have a cholera jab and you had to take it and then wait three days before you could travel. And, uh, but I been given a tip off by someone about keeping your jabs up to date and I'd always kept my jabs up to date and I was the only photographer in the office who had his jab up to date for, for cholera to go. So they had to send me. I went to a, a camp, a, a refugee camp. Of course there was no lights or, or running water or electricity or anything like that and the nurse came with a tilly lamp and it was just like Florence Nightingale, you know. The terrible sad thing was, next day when we came back, the child had died. Was... You always hope these things are going to be good, you know. 
I think most photographers will tell you the camera is a great defense against whatever you're looking at. And because when you put that to your eye, you're looking at framing and lighting and cropping and, and, and watching the person's eyes and, and all that tends to take away the actual horror of what you're recording. And I've truly been more shocked on, on a couple of occasions when I've sat at home and looked at one of my pictures in a way that I wasn't when I was taking it. What was your first appointment? Do you remember it? Yes, it was a, an early evening job. It was just getting dusk and I was told to go to Downing Street and just photograph the Prime Minister, I think it was coming back. And uh, I could see a little group of photographers around there, some of them wearing trilbies, it was so long ago. And they didn't say a word to me, completely ignored me. And I was thinking, oh, I was gonna be one of those famous photographers one day like them, you know, and then I thought, well, I just, you know, I just didn't like doing that. And I thought, well, I could be like that, or I could not, and I decided not. And after that, I always made it a point of trying to just you know, give someone a helping hand, you know. It's, it didn't hurt me, and, uh, and uh, I'm so thrilled I did because now I hear much later in life and I was suddenly ill and I had letters from all over the world, I can't tell you, saying really nice things. Mm -hmm, it's paid off. Well, I, I didn't do it for that reason, but... I've been told I've got cancer and it's a particular type of cancer that's incurable. So the doctors won't give you a time and uh, but I can see by the weight I'm losing and appetite and so on that uh, it's running away, the sands are running out. We'd gone to the hospital uh, and we're in the waiting room and uh, it was just, it, we had an appointment with the oncologist. In this sort of, sort of very bland and sterile environment, you know, a hospital waiting room, he'd seen the, the sun's rays coming through the window and reflecting in an interesting pattern on the floor. And for him, he, he found some beauty in that. We were just about to speak about the, the cancer and, you know, the, um, probably hear some really bad news, but he, he could rise above that. My life was just great, and then I was struck down by this. But you know, I just couldn't feel down. It was strange. We came away from the doctors and sat in the car. What should we do now then? I said, Well, I always wanted to go on that zip wire in North Wales. And so they all fixed it up then. One of the things we hated doing was the party conferences, you know? Because, you know, you hear the same political speech day after day after day. We went up to Blackpool for one of them, and it was storming down. It was a terrible day to arrive in Blackpool. And I was in bed at nine, nine o'clock. I thought, this is horrible. The window was rattling with the storm and just dropping off. Knock, knock on the door. And Mr. Downing, uh, the office is on for you. And so I had to get up and get dressed and go down to the foyer. So I said, yes, and I was really angry, and I said, yes. I said, uh, oh, John, um, uh, sorry, um, we know you've just arrived. I said, yes, I know I have. What? He said, well, um, we just wondered uh, if, you, um, if you wouldn't mind um, leaving. Uh, yes, <laughs> says the voice suddenly goes, Mr. Softy. Um, yes, where do you want me to go? Thinking it's going to be worse, you know, and he said, We'd like you to go on the Queen's tour of the South Pacific Islands to starting in Fiji. Can you come back right away? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and within 24 hours, I was in Fiji. Wow. And that was the fun of the job, you know. Just two years later, and it was a very different story. Through a dramatic turn of events, the Tory party conference in Brighton, 1984, was to pose an unlikely threat to John's life and resulted in one of his most recognisable photographs to date. It was the, the night before the big speech, the Prime Minister makes the speech, and the last thing she does before the night before is they have a ball. And I was uh, there and gradually all the journalists went, the photographers went, and I was the last one and I was 
kneeling down, chatting to a young couple. And, you know, 2.54, boom, off went the bomb. The explosion was an assassination attempt by the IRA. It killed five people and left another 34 injured. I walked around the front by the door, see if anyone was injured, shouting out, anyone injured? I couldn't, no replies. So then I climbed out the front window, and that's where the policeman was injured outside, but he was being attended to by his colleagues. There was a picture, poignant picture, I thought, of a young woman, and she was blooded on the face and had a very beautiful little dress. She'd always been to the ball, mm -hmm. and she was still carrying her little dancing shoes. In the... Then I saw, coming down the, the uh, fire escape, Maggie and all the people fussing around her. And they got in the car and I knew this was it. I could have one shot of this one because this car was not going to go slowly past me. And he went past me and I banged, in fact, banged the window with the camera, phoned the office, told them. I just caught the press, they stopped it. You know, it's one of those expressions you hear on the newspaper, yeah, stop the press. And, uh, <laughs> but um, we, got, we got the exclusive that night, so we got the story out. So it, it's not a great photographic picture, but it was a really important picture on the night. Welsh photographer John Downing has been witness to some of the most significant world events of our time. He won British Press Photographer of the Year an unprecedented seven times and was made an MBE in 1992. But his journey to success was not without its risks, personally and professionally. In 1972, Uganda dictator Idi Amin made the headlines when he banished all Asian people from the country. John Downing was among those who were tasked with reporting on the story. I want to see that the whole Kampala street is not full of Indians. It must be proper black and uh, administration in those shops is run by the Ugandans. Would you like to get all Asians out really, sir? Yes. What will happen to these people if they don't go by the time they're in? I think they will be sitting like they're sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? OK, you will <laughs> see. <laughs> It was an unlikely place for John and his colleague to draw on their Welsh heritage. But during his time in Uganda, the Welsh language became a surprise asset. We were having our phones tapped. And as soon as you tried to put over a story, they'd pull the plug on us. But I, we found if you were making personal calls, you could get through. So um, I came up with this ploy. I'd ring my mum and dad at home. I said, Mum, um, I've got a, a Welsh-speaking -speak report here with me. And she said, oh, that's lovely. And I, and I said, yes, he's, um, he's a poet as well. He, he was actually a poet. But was, uh, and uh, he, wants, uh, he wants you to uh, hear some of his poetry. And she said, oh, that, that's nice. Uh, right, put him on then. I put the reporter on to my mum. And he, get, he asked her to you know, tell the office that we're having our phones tapped and whatever. So then he went, he went off again and I went back on the phone. And I heard my mum, because my dad's listening to the phone as well, say, um, mum turned to him and said, oh, I don't think much of his poetry. <laughs> and dad said, give me the phone. <laughs> said, OK, John. Yes, that's a very nice poem. We understood it very nicely. Because <laughs> he spoke all in Welsh. And here was one cause where the language came first. And we could get all sorts of information out after that. The Ugandan government soon declared that all journalists were spies. John, along with many of his colleagues, were arrested by Amin's army. This is no word of a lie. He pulled his pistol out of here. He pushed it against my head, forced my head on the table, and he said, why are you spy on our country? And I just thought, 
I'm absolutely at this man's mercy. I could now start weeping and wailing and begging for it. And I thought, no, damn it, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't know, I just got in my head I was going to do it. I said, I'm not spying on you, I'm here, I'm a journalist. And there was dead silence, you know, for a minute. And then he just, gone. And he just took all his soldiers and left. John was taken to a prison in Kampala where he was held by Amin's men. They had not noticed he still carried his camera. The Brits are a great crowd to be with, you know, when you're in trouble. They were, I said, it's going to make a noise, the, you know, the camera shutter. So they said, oh, we'll have a coughing fit. So I mean, give me a nod. I give them a nod. They go, oh, <laughs> click. And, I, and that's how I got the picture. Tell me a bit about your family. Well, some things pay a penalty for you, do you know? And your home life is one of the things that suffers. Uh, you know, I was in prison on my son, son's birthday, Bryn's ninth birthday. I was in prison. <laughs> it's, it's not, you can't be much of a father like that, you know? But you feel that they were, the kids were proud. At least he, he had boasting rights when he went to school, you know, my dad's in the war. And, and they, uh, he, he always jokes about it now, but he said, you know, he, he got a lot of um, a lot of credit marks for that. Mm -hmm. He said, where's your dad now? Which war was he in? Mm -hmm. A lot of the photographs that you've taken seem to focus, even within the war scenario, seems to focus on people. What was your... Yes, well, I think you try and... It's the best way of trying to bring it home. You, you know, just showing bomb buildings or, you know, explosions and things, it doesn't... But, if you can catch the image on the face, particularly children, you know, they look so lost. They, they, they have dead eyes. They don't understand. They don't understand why they see people hurt and killing and, and blood. I often wonder, you know, what, what happened to these kids. Uh, I had to dress as a, as a woman crossing into Afghanistan one time. Yeah, that was a bit, a bit daft because, you know, I've got blue eyes, which they don't have for a kick off, and I'm tall, which the women tend not to be. So I sat in the back, I crouched right down, you know. How easy was it for you getting around in that space? Um, it was enormously hard work, hard walking. I mean, I lost two stone in, you know, in just six weeks I was there. They were very, very tough people, but photogenic, wonderful, wonderfully photogenic. On one occasion, I got, I did get, uh, they wanted me to go and photograph Sophie Loren in her flat in Paris, and that was special. Yeah, she was uh, quite glamorous. <laughs> she said, why are you breathing so deeply? I said, you don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, I suppose the, the biggest star of all was Princess Di, you know. Princess Diana, she, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to be given the job of photographing the engagement. I thought she was in kind of in a kind of slightly peculiar way, but I didn't say anything, just did the picture. And then I realised she was showing me the ring. Because we were all men. And of course us folks never thought about it, but she put it in the picture. And of course the first thing I got back, where's the ring? Uh, well we'll pull it up off this one here. John has now retired. And in 2007, he married Anita de Tellis, a successful pianist who plays for his beloved London Welsh male voice choir. The 
whole spectrum of humanity, I feel like he's met. And he's the sort of person who will, uh, not meaning to, but upstage people at dinner parties because they'll mention some things and, oh, yes, when I was, yeah. <laughs> I'd always have a better story, so. <laughs> When news broke of John's cancer diagnosis, a crowdfunding campaign was arranged to fund the publication of a book of his life's work. It's a chance for those who call him father, husband, brother, mentor, and friend to celebrate not only his photographs, but the man behind the camera who made them all possible. I was a young photojournalist working at a local newspaper and 19, I didn't know anyone, I didn't know anything about the industry. He took me under his wing and he taught me everything he knew. But the biggest thing is that he just believed in me. I wouldn't be working full time as a photojournalist if it wasn't for John Downing. So tonight is a incredible night. Um, not only are we celebrating this beautiful book, we're getting to celebrate the man himself. Obviously, I think he's a great man, and um, it, but it's lovely to hear other people also say the same thing. Tell me about the piece you were playing. It's a special piece for John and I. Um, a Chopin Nocturne is the piece that he's chosen he'd like at his funeral. I always said, I'd, lo I'd love to take a picture in the early days that will last beyond my lifetime. You know, that was important enough to be historically interesting, in other words. And, well, I don't know, really. I won't know until I... Uh, you won't know until I'm gone, really, whether I've taken a picture like that. So, uh, but I, I feel there's a couple of pictures I'm proud of. 